Previously on Patrick Explains. Ever since that video you recorded took off, you haven't even answered our calls. I think the success is going to his head. Brought to you by Willemsware Patios. The only cereal with my face on the box. I'm really concerned about him. Thanks everyone for making it here today. Present at this deposition are myself, my associate legal counsel for the Internal Revenue Service, the defendant, the defendant's attorney, and for some reason, the defendant's parents. Hey, I'm Hank. Patrick, please be smart here. These are very serious accusations. Will the defendant please state their name for the record? Patrick Willems. Mr. Willems, do you understand that you are under oath? Yes, I do. On August 23rd, you publicly admitted that you do not pay your taxes, stating, quote, Yeah, I never pay my taxes. Whatever, sue me. Is this correct? Mr. Willems, is this correct? Is he writing something? What is he doing? I grabbed that. It appears that my client is repeatedly drawing the letter Z as well as a sketch depicting himself as that sword-wheeling character, Zorro. Excuse me, Zorro? Yes, Zorro. Yes, that's right, Zorro. The cinema landscape of 1998 was very different compared to what it is now. Disaster movies were all the rage, romantic comedies actually got released in theaters, and the comic book movie boom was still a few years away. Mr. Willems, you do understand you're under oath, In right? the midst of this strange time, there came a movie that low-key did the best reboot of an iconic character maybe ever. It's not technically a superhero movie, but it sort of is one of the best superhero movies ever made. It's a swashbuckler, an old school adventure movie, a revenge story, a very sexy love story, a historical epic, and a movie where Anthony Hopkins does gymnastics. It's the mask of Zorro, baby. We as a society have sadly forgotten that this movie slaps so hard, and today, we're gonna talk about why. Look, I'm assuming that most people under the age of 60 aren't super well-versed in the finer aspects of Zorro mythology. I'm not either, or I wasn't until I did 15 minutes worth of research last week. The basic stuff is that Zorro's secret identity is Don Diego de la Vega, a rich Californian in either the late 1700s or early 1800s. It's messy. He lives in a big mansion with a secret cave underneath, and at night dresses in a black cape and mask and fights crime, protecting the common people from corrupt villains. So. He's basically Batman, which is why famously Bruce Wayne's parents happened to take him to see the 1940 movie The Mark of Zorro on the night they were murdered. The Zorro similarities are so blatant that they kinda had to address it. Zorro originally existed in a bunch of books by writer Johnston McCulley. He showed up in movies starting in 1920 where he was played by Douglas Fairbanks and later by Tyrone Power. Disney produced a Zorro TV show from 1957 to 1959, and I gotta say, that theme song kinda rules. This old renegade carves a Z with his blade, a Z that stands for Zorro. And then for like 40 years, Zorro mostly faded from the mainstream. He's not actually in the public domain, but he kind of fell in with those other public domain characters like King Arthur or Robin Hood, where everyone is aware of them, but no one is really a fan. And then, in 1998, Zorro returned. Director Martin Campbell, hot off revamping the James Bond series with Goldeneye, cast Antonio Banderas in the title role, and basically gave a masterclass in how to reboot an old-fashioned iconic character, retaining everything people know and like about him, but updating and, dare I say, improving certain aspects. So, for an average person, what would you say are the core elements of Zorro that everyone expects to see? It's okay, I'll take this. The core elements are as follows. A guy in a black mask and cape, some sword fights, a black horse, Mexico, evil rich people. That's pretty much it. So good news, this movie has all of that. Actually, all of that stuff is in the first 10 minutes. No waiting around for an hour as we go through another generic origin story. It gets right to the good shit. 
The wild thing about this movie is that it perfectly functions as a continuation or sequel to the previous iterations of Zorro. There's no reason this can't be considered absolutely in continuity with the 1940 movie or the 50s TV show. And by calling it the Mask of Zorro instead of just like, Zorro, it connects to the Mark of Zorro and functions as a reboot and a sequel. At the start of the movie, Don Diego de la Vega is Zorro just like he always was, except apparently this is set like 15 years or so later. He's older and pretty much ready to retire. And the movie is about him stepping down and training a new Zorro, except this Zorro isn't another rich guy. He's an actual man of the people, an orphan from the streets, who's fighting for people just like him. This is important for two reasons. One, it fixes the weird class aspect that permeates so many of our beloved costumed heroes. I love Batman and Tony Stark, but it's a little weird how much we obsess over these stories of benevolent billionaires saving us regular people. And two, The Mask of Zorro is Batman Beyond a year before Batman Beyond premiered. Seriously, it's the same premise, which really makes you think about how that point in time there was this cluster of stories about iconic heroes passing the mantle to successors, and how in the 90s DC Comics were really focusing on the idea of legacy, with former sidekicks stepping up to become the main heroes. And then in the 21st century, these all went away as culture became obsessed with nostalgia and bringing back status quo from several decades earlier. Can we please get back to the matter at hand? Agreed. Patrick, you're saying about Zorro? So hey, you want to see some clever filmmaking? The opening shot of this movie has a kid cutting two eye holes in a piece of black canvas and looking out through them. It looks like a mask. And then that same kid grows up and actually puts on the real Mask of Zorro. It's the whole movie foreshadowed in the opening shot, filmmaking. Look, as much as I love this movie, I do need to address the fact that it's a movie about Mexican people starring almost no actual Mexican actors. Antonio Banderas, he's from Spain, and Anthony Hopkins and Catherine Zeta-Jones are Welsh. This is a classic case of whitewashing. This does not diminish my love for the movie, but I completely understand if it does for anyone else. Now that we've covered the serious stuff, let's move on. Okay, so let's talk about the actual story of this movie. We get our prologue with Anthony Hopkins as an older Zorro, and I want to point out that this is a movie where Anthony Hopkins does gymnastics. He straight up does an uneven bars routine. Here's how powerful movie magic is. They tell me, yes, this is 60-year-old Anthony Hopkins doing flips off of buildings, and I say, sure, that checks out. Stunt performers are amazing, aren't they? Let's get an Oscar category for them. So Don Diego de la Vega goes home to his wife and infant daughter and is like, I'm too old for this shit and so is my horse. And then his arch nemesis shows up, has deduced that he's Zorro, accidentally kills his wife, throws him in prison for life, steals his daughter to raise as his own, and on top of all of that, he burns his goddamn house down. What a dick! This is definitely one of the top five coldest villain moves of all time. And then we jump forward 20 years. That kid named Alejandro who helped Zorro in the opening scene and peeks through the eye holes is now a dirty scumbum thief whose brother is murdered by this military captain who's the right-hand man of the main bad guy, and he vows revenge. Meanwhile, Diego has been in prison for two decades, just stewing in his hatred for that bastard Raphael. And when he learns Raphael is back in California, he escapes and goes to get revenge. So now our storylines converge. These two guys both want revenge on two bad guys who are working together and are clearly up to no good. What's better than one revenge story? A double revenge story. So Diego is like, hey, I'm old, you're young, let me train you so we can wreck these guys. And also, hey, the guy I hate raised my daughter as his own and she's staggeringly hot, so if you guys want to get together, I would not mind. So it's basically the Count of Monte Cristo. You've got the guy whose life was destroyed, vowing revenge, and making a commoner into a nobleman in order to infiltrate high society. That's also kind of like Aladdin, which makes sense because the same guys who wrote this movie wrote Aladdin. But there's also all the fun Batman stuff, like a mask and a cape. Look, I'm not gonna lie, almost every movie would be better if the main character wore a cape. 12 Angry Men, Solaris, Working Girl, add capes, instantly improved. This has got to be the dumbest deposition I've ever done. So an interesting fact about The Mask of Zorro is that it's one of the sexiest movies ever made. It's common in superhero movies to have some sort of romantic subplot. And over the past 20 years, those romantic subplots have ranged from charming to barren. Peter and Mary Jane, 
It's nice. They love each other. Thor and Jane Foster. Uh, the actors are pretty. The Marvel movie's version of sexuality is mostly immature flirtation which can be fine, but after a while feels like a waste of all these beautiful people they keep casting. And then, there's Zorro. It's a proven scientific fact, and yes, I did the research, that in the year 1998, Catherine Zeta-Jones and Antonio Banderas were the two hottest human beings alive. So putting them together in the same movie and getting them to kiss? Great decision. But. The movie doesn't just settle for that. You know what this movie has that every superhero movie should have? Or just every movie in general? A scene where the characters just fucking tear up the dance floor. They're dancing so hard. Look, they're sweating, they're breathing heavily. Just look at them. And then they meet again and have a sexy sword fight where they're just trying to cut each other's clothing off. Not bad. And Elena already admitted to a priest that she had impure thoughts about Zorro, but that was Zorro pretending to be a priest, so he knows how she feels. Last four. Yes, last four. The sexual energy in The Mask of Zorro could power a city. Here's the thing about this movie. Zorro fucks. Hey, can I get a drink here? Is there any whiskey? My client would like a drink. No, you can't have a drink during a deposition, and you should know better. <sighs> Lame. You ever think about how Martin Campbell made the greatest superhero reboot of all time and saved the James Bond series twice? No? Just me? Martin Campbell is not a visionary. He isn't in auteur. I don't think anyone can tell you what defines a Martin Campbell movie. And look, he's a guy who also made some real stinkers, but when it comes to classical action-adventure movies, he just gets it. He gets how to stage a great action scene with rad practical stunt work. He gets how to incorporate comedy into action. He can do romance. Remember, Casino Royale is really the only Bond movie to have a truly believable love story. And he understands the importance of iconic images. If you'll allow me to stand up on my soapbox for a moment, I've got a bit of a beef with the way the past 20 years of comic book or superhero movies have handled iconography and theatricality. I think they got scared of seeming goofy or unrealistic, and they forgot that with this genre and this kind of character, sometimes you just gotta do a cool shot where the hero poses because it looks fucking cool. Sure, in the real world, they probably wouldn't just stand there like that for no reason, but it looks rad, so who really gives a shit? Look, talk all the shit you want about the Joel Schumacher Batman movies, but you know what part of them rules? That final shot where the heroes run toward the camera in slow motion in front of the bat signal while the main theme plays in all its glory. This is not meant to be taken literally. It's not a part of the story. It's just pure iconography. This is a visual medium, and imagery matters. And Zorro? Zorro does the exact same thing. The Mask of Zorro begins and ends with Zorro marching out on a big backlit stage and then carving his logo in the screen, but it's on fire because this movie is so goddamn hot. These shots, whether Zorro or Batman, are really just carrying on a cinematic tradition dating back to 1962. This is their spin on the James Bond gun barrel that opens every Bond movie. Not everything has to be literal. Sometimes, it's okay just to be cool. And look, Martin Campbell's understanding of iconic images goes beyond just the Zorro silhouette. He understands that sometimes you gotta have your hero pose on a horse rearing up on its hind legs in front of a sunset. Sometimes you gotta have Zorro hold his sword so the gleam of sunlight reflects down the length of it. Sometimes you gotta have Zorro make a giant flaming version of his logo on the side of the hill. And yeah, I know the crow did it first, but Zorro did it better. Of course, we can't forget that this is an action movie, and it's the kind of action movie that we never get anymore. The kind where the big money shot isn't a bunch of CGI characters smashing into buildings. It's Antonio Banderas standing up on two horses at the same time and jumping over a log. Look how cool that is. It's, it's so cool. Remember when movies would have like a 10 second long wide shot where people just fought with swords? Don't you miss that? This is a movie that goes so hard. Whenever there's a big sound, like an explosion, they throw a wildcat roar on there, just to make it extra hardcore. A 
but it's also a movie that makes time for horse comedy, arguably the finest of all forms of animal comedy. The villain is introduced snorting cocaine, and he calls Diego a class traitor. A traitor to your country and your class. And complains about all the peasants overrunning California. I'm sorry that I could not protect this country from the peasants who have overrun it. So you know that guy's gotta die. And the other villain murders Alejandro's brother and stores his head in a jar like a true fucking psycho. Look at this guy. His whole vibe screams confederacy. He doesn't really say it, but you know this guy is racist as hell and would totally be best friends with Michael Fassbender from 12 Years a Slave. The whole movie, you want these two guys to die so bad, and then, uh, spoilers, they do. <laughs> to use an official term from the world of cinema studies, this is what is known as a double vengeance overkill combo. Very rare in film, but very satisfying. I don't know why we all kind of forgot how good The Mask of Zorro is. Maybe we got distracted by the new shiny toy of superhero movies with all their colorful costumes and fancy visual effects, but we've seen a lot of these by now, and it really makes you appreciate how much better Zorro is in so many ways. I think modern movies, especially movies about people who dress up in costumes to fight crime, could learn some important lessons from this one. So. Here are my top five lessons Hollywood should learn from The Mask of Zorro. Number one, be charming, not snarky. Number two, sometimes you just gotta pose because it looks cool. Number three, be sexier. Let's get some actual heat in those romantic subplots. Number four, watching people sword fight while doing backflips wearing capes will always be cooler than a million CGI buildings being destroyed. And number five, in the end credits, you gotta have a pop song set to the melody of the movie's main theme. I want to spend my loving you. Come on, where's the love duet from the Avengers? So I encourage all of you to go home tonight, crack open a bottle of wine, and watch The Mask of Zorro. Mr. Willems, are you done? Yes. Did I answer your questions? No, you literally answered none of them. He did confirm his name. I did confirm my name. Is he always like this? Usually, yes. Sometimes he's actually more annoying. Well, this has all been a huge waste of time. Now hold on. I think you're ignoring some key parts of my client's testimony. Such as? Such as all the points he made about Zorro. Zorro? Yes, Zorro. That bold renegade who carves a Z with his blade. The Z that stands for Zorro. Is there a gas leak? I think we are done here. Mr. Willems, it is a mistake to toy with the IRS. We'll see you in court. I think that went really well. So do I. Can you draw me a Zorro now? Patrick, I really think you should consider getting a new lawyer. Hey everyone, I hope you're all doing okay during this chaotic time we're living through and are keeping sane while cooped up in your homes. I came up here to shoot this video with my parents and then with things the way they are, figured it was best to just stick around until it's safe to go back to New York. Mom, I hope that's okay with you. You betcha. Great. You wanna take it? Look, we all need things to keep us entertained while we're stuck at home. So let me tell you about Nebula. It's a streaming platform Patrick helped develop last year along with a bunch of other YouTubers. My favorite creators, uh, and probably yours too. It's a platform with all of our videos ad-free as well as exclusive original projects we're making, stuff that's different from our regular videos. And pretty soon he's going to be starting production on a short film, the most ambitious project he's ever made. And it's going to be premiering on Nebula. And here's the cool part, because Curiosity Stream, they love what we're doing with Nebula, they partnered up with us and created a bundle. And if you sign up for Curiosity Stream, you get a bonus Nebula subscription for free. So if you want to stay entertained while under quarantine, this is the perfect thing. You get Curiosity Stream's great library of documentaries. All of Nebula with our videos and original productions, you're supporting independent creators like me, 
and you'll be able to watch my short film as soon as it premieres. Sounds pretty good. It does. Mom, did you sign up for Curiosity Stream and Nebula? I just did. So there you go. Be like my mom and sign up today. That was great. We got it. We, we did it. We did it. <laughs> I think that was it. Perfect. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back. Thank you so much for watching. A few people I wanna thank, obviously our cast for this video. I wanna thank my friend Brian Reed, as well as Devin from Legal Eagle for answering my questions about the legal stuff and telling me how a deposition works because I don't know. Obviously I wanna thank our usual team of Matt and Jake Torpy and Mike Curran for helping with the script and the story for this. And look, since we're all stuck at home right now, I wanna let you know that The Mask of Zorro is currently on Netflix. So you can watch it right now for some weird reason Netflix got rid of the opening text at the beginning that gives the historical background. I don't know, Netflix is weird, physical media forever. But hey, watch it, have some fun, stay safe, I hope you're all doing well, and I'll be back soon.